ли? Да? К тому, что не от худа без добра. Профессор Яу я с нами пока что. Все равно. Все. We switch to English. Okay, so everyone can see my slides. Yes. yes. Okay, great. Uh, then let's start. So, yeah, first of all, thank you for inviting to give this talk. And uh, also, you should feel free to ask me any questions. If something is not clear, I will try to monitor chat as well. So, okay, let's start. So let me first tell you what I'm planning to talk about today. So the main object of interest for me is certain McDonald hierarchy of semantic functions. Uh, or mostly I will be interested in combinatorics of the members of this family of functions. The most famous member of this family are so-called sure functions, which appear in various mathematical contexts from representation theory to probability theory. And also these functions possess a lot of nice combinatorial properties and uh, structure, which is usually a subject of algebraic combinatorics. And probably this talk will be closer to this side of the study of semantic functions. On the other end of this hierarchy, there is a family of so-called McDonald functions, which is parameterized by two parameters Q and T. And uh, when these parameters are equal, McDonald functions can set with sure functions. And between we have a lot of other different functions which appear in different contexts, namely whole little functions when Q is equal to zero, uh, so-called sure P and Q functions, which are obtained as a particular case of whole little functions when Q is equal to zero and T is equal to minus one. Also there are Jack functions, which are obtained by a certain limit transition from McDonald functions. And also there are such so-called Whitaker Q functions, which are obtained by setting T equal to zero, unlike whole little case. So basically I will, today I'll try to talk about some connections between combinatorics of side of these functions and another object with different origin, namely solvable vertex models. So let me start by explaining the language of vertex models I will be using for the whole talk. Generally, I will consider some collections of lines on which I, on this slide I have drawn in gray. And usually these lines will be forming a square grid in all applications I will be using my vertex models. On intersections of this lines, I have vertices and between these vertices, I have edges. Then a configuration of a model is assignment of labels to all the edges. So here they're drawn in some blue color. And well, these labels will be from different sets in my applications, but Usually this will be some integers. So having find what is a configuration, actually we are not interested in all configurations of the model, but rather we're interested in configurations satisfying some boundary conditions. Namely, we give some restriction on possible values of labels on the edges of our model. And then for each vertex, we have a certain weight, which is called sometimes Boltzmann weight, which depends only on the labels of edges adjacent to this vertex. And a partition function is a sum of all configurations satisfying boundary conditions of the product of all weights over all the vertices. So this is some general formalism I will be using. And uh, in this general formalism, I will be considering not all possible vertex weights, but rather weights which satisfy a certain condition, namely they satisfy so-called Young-Baxter equation. Namely, 
if I will have a box equation tells me that for a pair of vertex weights P1 and P2, I have a certain identity of partition functions with a third weight R and uh, namely we can draw this partition function on the left hand side consisting of three lines with some order of vertex space R, P1 and P2. And uh, we can, informally speaking, move the vertex with R weight through the column consisting of other two vertices, exchanging vertices P1 and P2, but preserving boundary conditions of the partition function. So basically this is some nice algebraic identity which I will be repeatedly used to prove various algebraic properties of my partition functions. So let me give you an example of this formalism. Let us consider- Just, just a second. On the left, you have just one weight or the partition function when so on the left, I have a partition function which has fixed labels on the boundary and also consists of three vertex, vertices, P1, P2, and rho. And this partition function is actually uh, sum over various labels for internal edges of uh, the weight of this vertex, R times the weight of the vertex P1 and times the weight of the vertex P2. There will be some labels. And on the other side, I have very similar sum over internal edges here, but the vertices will be uh, connected differently. And this sum can in principle be infinite. Is that correct? Well, in all the cases I will be using it, it will be finite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Possible. Oh, thank you. So, okay. So let me give you an example. Uh, so I will sorry, be Do you have like d different weights at each vertex? Yes, the weights might be different. Generally, uh, this vertex weights will be very similar to each other, but will have some different parameters. So let me just tell you a simple example of what I mean by all this general formalism. I hope it will be clearer what I mean by this young Baxter equation. So let me consider the following example. I, my edge labels will be taken from a simple set consisting of two elements, zero and one. And I will draw configurations of such model by either filling my edge between vertices or leaving it empty. And I will allow only these six configurations of vertices. So one can see that these configurations can be interpreted in a way that we have a path which might enter from below or from the left, and then it exits through the top or through the right. And to these six possible vertices, I will assign weights. Most of them will be one with the exception of X assigned to the configuration when we have a straight line parting from left to right and zero, so we are forbidding this configuration when we have a straight line coming in vertical direction. And then I claim that, so this phase depends on one parameter X here. And I claim that depending on this parameter, we can construct Young-Baxter equation. Namely, if we would take vertices with weights X, Y and Y minus X, then we can reshuffle them and get the Ambaxter equation. For example, so this Ambaxter equation holds for any boundary conditions on the edges, boundary edges. So for example, we will take here 
something like uh, one zero um, one zero zero zero, and here we'll take the corresponding boundary position here. Uh, what options do I have here? So here we'll have configuration like this on the left hand side, which you have weight one plus configuration like this, which will have weight zero because of this vertex. And on the other hand, I will have just one configuration, which will also have weight one. And my claim is that if I will change this boundary conditions to any possible configuration, this identity will be true and the partition functions on the left hand side and on the right hand side will coincide. So I hope. Sorry, this could you explain? Clear. May I ask a question? Yes. If, if the edges are not horizontal or vertical, how do you distinguish between X and zero cases? Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. I, not, I have not mentioned it, but I also fixed some sort of an orientation. So here I have uh, one angle of my vertex where I draw its parameter. And here I have the same angle here. So basically this vertex is just uh, the same vertex rotated by 45 degrees uh, in the clockwise direction. So basically this is the same as zero, one, something, something. And here we have this parameter y minus x. So yes, basically there is also some orientation. So graphically when I'm drawing these vertices, I, it's also useful to keep track of some orientation. So when I rotate these vertices, it is clear how exactly it is oriented. So does the science satisfy you? Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. And, and in your lower drawing, you have letters x and y. What are they? So these are parameters of the vertex and uh, let me give have, you- Have parameters on the, on the edges, not on the vertex, no? Uh, I have vertex weights and this vertex weights also depend on some parameters in this mm. example. So here I have vertex weights above, but instead of X, I will have parameter Y, y minus X for this vertex. Mm. And for this vertex, I will have instead of x parameter y. Mm. Okay. And yeah, this parameter comes into play if you consider different boundary conditions, namely if we will take something like this, we will have configuration, which will have weight x plus configuration, which will have weight something like uh, y minus x. And on the right hand side, we will have just one configuration which will have weight y. And you can see that x by y minus x is equal to y. So these parameters are arranged in a certain way that whenever they will appear in my weights, they will somehow cancel out so the identity holds. So are there any other questions about this slide? It's not a question, but rather a, a remark. Maybe for okay. most of audience, it's more familiar to think about Jan Bach's equation in terms of uh, some operator acting in a tensor product of two spaces. And then you just multi put it into the linear operator in the tensor product of three spaces, putting one yes. in three different places, and then writing yes. the I will mentioned this point of view, but a bit later. So yes, yeah, this is actually a point of view I will be using at some point, but for now, I just want to restrict myself to this combinatorial description. And yeah, later I will return to the connection with air matrix of my, my quantum groups, but for now, let me give some simple combinatorial example. So yeah, we have this vertex weights. This model is called five vertex model. 
because I have only five vertices with non-zero weights. And actually it turns out that you can use this five vertex model to give an expression for sure functions. So basically let's consider the following partition function. Uh, I have a rectangle consi consisting of n horizontal lines and some number of columns where I have fixed some partition lambda of length n. And I define my boundary condition on this module in a certain way so that on the bottom I have zero labels as well as on the right edge of my model. At the same time from the left, I have all boundary conditions sent to ones. And on the top, my boundary condition somehow encodes the partition I have fixed in the beginning. And namely, I will have ones only at positions uh, lambda i plus n minus i. And all other partitions will, be, and all other labels on top will be zero. And well, as I mentioned, it's convenient to think about configurations of this model as a collection of some upright paths. So in terms of right path, right up paths, I will have a path and several paths, paths entering from the left, and then they will exit at positions which are prescribed by my partition. Finally, I will define my vertex weights as the same weights as on the previous slide, where the parameter x for the vertices on the first row will be x1, for the vertices on the second row will be x2, and so on. And it turns out that this partition function coincides with sure functions. Namely, if I will draw my configuration of this, vert of this vertex model as a collection of upright paths, then one can see that vertical segments of these paths interlace in a certain way. And this inter and the numbers and the positions in the, the numbers of columns of these vertical segments uh, will give us the so-called Gilfand-Settling pattern where it will be somehow shifted because I have considered initially some shifted model and it will have some in, some strict inequalities going in this direction and non strict inequalities going in this direction. And uh, moreover, since we had weights x1, x2, and x3, one can check that the, and the only way the vertex contributes a weight is through vertical lines or through horizontal lines. So one can check that contribution of vertex weights from this part will be exactly x1 taken to the power lambda 1, 1. Then contribution on the second row will be actually the difference between the entries of the second row, this Gifan setting pattern and the first one and so on. And uh, some kind of the cut, it turns out that the whole partition function I have described actually just encodes the combinatorial definition of sure functions, which I have written here in terms of interlacing partitions. So in a certain way, this vertex model is just a nice way to reformulate the combinatorial definition of sure functions. The point I want to make here that this reformulation is actually sometimes useful. Namely, as I mentioned, sure functions are semantic functions. So in particular, the whole partition function I have described should be semantic in variables x1 and x2. And this can be seen using young baxter equation. So for example, let's take just two consecutive rows of my partition function with the lower row having vertices with parameter x1 and the upper row having vertices with parameters x2. And then I want to show that the partition function is symmetric in x1 and x2. To do so, I draw an additional vertex on the right, which will have, due to the boundary conditions, it will have 
zero labels on top and on the right. And hence the only configuration it can admit is just zero configuration with weight one. So adding this vertex is harmless in terms of the resulting function. But now I can use Young Baxter equation to move this vertex through columns of this partition function one by one and end up with very similar picture. But now I have this additional vertex on the left. And also after application of my Young Baxter equations, x1 and x2 exchanged. So here x1 is above x2 because of this Young Baxter equation. And now again, this additional vertex will be trivial because of the boundary condition consisting on one, one on the left. So it will be again one and I can forget about it. And the result will be the same partition function but with X1 and X2 exchanged. So this example is, the main idea of this example is to show that I can formulate my special functions, namely true functions in this case, using vertex models. And then to, I can use Young-Baxter equation to somehow add them an additional vertex on the right and then move it to the left. And such Young-Baxter equations will turn out in some a priori non-obvious algebraic relations for partition functions, which will translate to certain properties of the original symmetric functions. And this is somehow the main idea of my talk today, I want to convey that using the ambassador equations, we can prove algebraic properties of partition functions and find connection of these properties with symmetric functions. So, Sirius, may I ask a question? Yes. There are eight vertex models, or there are elliptic solutions to young Baxter equations. Do they produce yes. any symmetric, interesting function? Mm -hmm. Approach. Actually, this is a good question. They will produce something which will be, but I'm not so sure that they I don't know the answer to these questions. Okay. So, yes, this is something I have not studied yet. Uh, for the eight vertex model, this argument I just mentioned will not work like very simply because in eight vertex model, you don't have this frozen configuration and we have one one. In eight vertex model, we can have zero zero here and one one. That's why the argument I just mentioned will be more complicated. But it doesn't mean that nothing nice is possible, it's just I don't just, know if there is some realization. If anyone looked in this direction, Probably you should. I don't know. Okay, thank you. So, yes, but okay, so yeah, elliptic vertex model, this is something I don't know, but people looked in other directions, and namely, let me show this slide where people learned to, rather recently how to construct other symmetric functions of this McDonald hierarchy using vertex models. And basically on this slide, I listed functions which somehow received some attention in the last five years or so. And I will try to cover all these models today to some extent. But most I will focus my attention on the whole Littlewood and Q Whitaker functions and the reason for this that turns out that using vertex model formalism, we can somehow extend this function ending in additional deformation parameter, which is called spin parameter. And it will turn out that the resulting deformed functions, which can be somehow naturally constructed using vertex models, will satisfy all the combinatorial functions of the original whole little and few vertical functions. So and what, the, what is the relation between spin and q, the value of a spin? Mm -hmm. What's the relation between, I see two parameters, q in Whittaker, k, 
and spin. Is there a direct relation between spin and how they, they are connected? So uh, the idea will be that Q will be somehow connected to quantum parameter of a quantum group, while spin will be connected to the highest weight of Brema modules for which we will be considering air matrix acting on. Okay, so, thank you. Yes, this is the general idea how this spin parameter is related to other context. So yeah, now let me return to the point which was made earlier by Igor. So where we can take, so I, I before I just describe some combinatorial example of vertex weights and young Baxter equation, but actually there is a, a huge like theory where we can take good vertex from which we can take good vertex weights, which will satisfy young Baxter equation. And namely we can take this vertex space by considering uh, coefficients of an R matrix of some quantum group uh, acting on some pair of representations. So the vertex space I have mentioned above can be obtained as certain degeneration of so-called six vertex model, which the weights I depicted here. And these weights actually can, well, after some renormalization, uh, can side with the uh, a matrix coefficient of R matrix of uh, quantization of affine SL2 acting on two dimensional representations of it. And the resulting weights, as I as was mentioned, will satisfy the Young Baxter equation due to the classical interpretation of the Baxter equation as some identity of some commutation identity of operators acting on triple tensor product of representations. And in the pictures I was drawing before, my lines are actually can be thought as representations of quantum group. But of course there are more general representations and uh, we can consider more general vertex models by considering other representations and the coefficients of R matrix acting on this pair of more general pairs of representations. And the first model I want to talk about is the model for so called spin hole Littlewood functions. Uh, in this model, we will still have horizontal edges labeled by zero and one. But in the vertical direction, we can have any non negative integer label. So in terms of the interpretation, the path interpretation of my configurations, this means that along the horizontal direction, we can have only one, at most one path along each horizontal edge, but on the, along the vertical edges, we can have as many paths as we want. The vertex weights of this model have an explicit depression written here, and they depend on two parameters, U and S. So how we should think about this vertex weights. So these vertex weights are actually coefficients of R matrix of the quantization of a finite cell two acting on two dimensional representation times some, mm, let's take, uh, I don't know. W Verma module of my quantum group where the its highest way lambda will correspond to the spin parameter S. And here the horizontal line will correspond to the two-dimensional representation while the vertical line will correspond to this Verma module. Reinforcing this similarity with, uh, well, reinforcing this origin of quantum groups, well, for some sort of integer values of my 
highest pair of Verma modules, this Verma module will have a reducible portion, which will define a dimensional. So the connection between this highest weight of my Verma module and the spin parameter can be seen from the fact that actually when I have my spin parameter equal to uh, something like Q to some integer power minus integer power over two, this vertex weight will have some cancellation and they will restrict my vertex model to the vertex where I can have no more than G pass passing through the horizontal, through the vertical direction. And that will correspond to the existence of uh, the solids of the quotient, which will be a finite dimensional presentation. So basically, this identity should give some idea how the spin parameter is uh, uh, related to the highest weight of the Verma module. But as I mentioned before, I'm mean, more interested in combinatorics of such models, and I will not be actually using this origin from quantum groups at all, besides from the fact that the resulting weight will satisfy certain Abbasto equation, which is written here. So here, the spin parameter corresponds to the horizontal line, and it is fixed for both vertices. While spectral parameter V and U will exchange in my Yamas equation, and the cross term, uh, this intertwining vertex, which exchanges this highest spin weights, will be just a matrix between two dimensional presentations I mentioned earlier. So having set up this vertex space satisfying the last equation, we now consider a following vertex model. Here, similarly to the Schur case, we have several rows and an arbitrary number of columns. And on the bottom, we have zero as well as on the right, while from the left, we have free boundary condition and the top row, the top boundary condition sample accounts a partition, which will be corresponding to the partition of my whole little function, which will be whole little function. And uh, the parameters of my vertex, all my vertex space are the vertex which I depicted on the previous slide. And on the first row, it will have the same parameter. All, all of them will have the same spin parameter while the weights on the first row will have spectral parameter U1, on the second row spectral parameter U2, and so on. So here is an example of configuration which will be valid for the boundary conditions that it will be corresponding to partition 553, because here we have two paths exiting in fifth column. And here we have another past exit in the third column. So this particular function defines some object which is called spin holito functions. And what are the properties of these functions? So first of all, they will be symmetric. And this can be proved using literally the same argument I have explained earlier for true functions. We can add an additional artificial vertex on the right end of my partition function, move it through the whole model using kang equation, and then it will cancel out on the left edge of my partition function. And the result will be the same partition function, but with two variables u exchanged. And this will prove that the resulting functions will be symmetric. More involved fact, is that these functions have an explicit expression which is given in terms of a sum over symmetric group. And uh, this expression, uh, for those of you who know, might resemble the 
actual definition of the usual whole little functions, namely when the spin parameter is equal to zero, this will be just the usual whole little functions. And this explicit expression will just literally coincide with the definition of whole little functions. To prove this expression, one can use so-called better ansatz, algebraic better ansatz, and which also uses young bastard equation in a non-trivial way. I don't want to, the, the argument will be not trivial, so I don't want to go into its details, but basically you can use young bastard equation to perform an algebraic better ansatz like argument and to prove such an explicit expression for the resulting partition function. Finally, there is so-called Cauchy type identity for the resulting spin function, higher spin for little functions. And let me tell you what are Cauchy identities and how I prefer to think about them. So Cauchy identities in a certain way correspond to orthogonality of Symmetric functions, and uh, in this McDonald theory, Cauchy type summation identity, the name identities of the form where we have summation over all partition of two symmetric functions in different variables, giving some nice kernel. Identities of such time play an important role in the McDonald classification because, in a certain way, all of these good symmetric functions from McDonald hierarchy are characterized by existence of some identity like this, some Cauchy type identity. And the fact that we can take some symmetric function, namely whole little function, and add there an additional parameter S in a way that the Cauchy identity will still hold is a trivial fact which somehow tells us that the resulting functions are an interesting object which is worth studying and uh, somehow distinguishes this construction from all other constructions you can make from vertex models. So this Cauchy identity plays a very important role in the game and one can prove this using also very similar argument exchanging roles based on a master equation. So let me- Sorry, <coughs> sorry. Yes. yes. What is the number of arguments uh, in the functions of lambda? So it is uh, n variable. So the functions of lambda depend on n variables, which where n is the, is greater or equal than the length of my partition, because otherwise it will be zero. Uh, Arbitrary number greater, yeah. Yes, and th these functions will turn out to be stable when I will set some parameter lambda to, well, in a certain way stable. If I will set some parameter mu to equal to s, it will actually reduce the number of variables. So the number of variables in the Cauchy type identity is different for F lambda and F lambda C. Yeah? Yes. Mm. I see. So, okay, there are actually, in the literature, there are several analogs of spin whole little functions. Here I'm talking about, and they have different properties. And here I'm talking about the version of them which is have some certain stability property which is more resembling to the classical theory of symmetric functions so sorry uh, what is f lambda c so okay f lambda c is um, the same function of lambda but multiplied by a certain constant which will be so um, f lambda c will be equal to f lambda times some constant, which will be some product of Kuba-Heimer symbols depending on my partition lambda and parameter s. So it will be 
essentially it will be the same function, but multiplied by a certain renormalization constant. And so can you put C equal to one? No, C is a formal symbol, which means that this is like conjugate of the usual function. So it's more like, so this is actually different function, which differ by just multiplication by constant. So it, it's, it is not orthogonality, it's rather by orthogonality. Uh, yes, it's by orthogonality. Oh, well, we can rescale them so it will be actual orthogonality because it's just a scalar which does not depend on the variables of the functions. Okay, thank you. And yes, and this is similar to the also usual story for semantic functions where you have in Pasha identities, we have some of actually some functions and their dual which differ from P by some constant, which is sometimes denoted by B lambda. So the story here is similar. We have actually two functions, the original functions and the dual functions, which will differ by certain rescaling by a constant, by some scalar. So let me tell you how to prove such a shared identity using hang equation. Uh, first of all, we should take our original model and reflect it with respect to the horizontal direction. So instead of paths going to the right and up, we will have paths going to going to the right and down or equivalently pass, which will go in the up left direction. And then the after this reflection, we will have some kind of a dual model where on top we will have zero boundary conditions that on the right. On the bottom will be something we will be encoding in the same way my parti our partition lambda. And on the left we will have free boundary condition. Then we should rescale the weights of this dual reflected model by the product of this Pankamia symbols, which will actually result in that constant uh, uh, I was mentioning when talking about difference of F lambda and F lambda C. So we should rescale this dual weights. And then after such rescalement, the resulting dual weights and the original weights will satisfy a young baxter equation where the intertwining vertex will be actually some renormalization of the usual six vertex model. And then after constructing this. Uh, yes. Usually this, what you, Call spin. Uh, it's called RTT equ equations. So, what's this conjugation yeah. in terms of RTT equation? So, you. So, here I'm actually using a certain symmetry of my vertex weights. Mm. Namely, here I can write so, this. So there are three, ten three representation and you have R acting in tensor product of two, similar than yes. E acting in the product of one and Birma model, the basic and Birma model. So, and there is RTT relation, which is yes, young Baxter equation. Or, yes. Uh, so I just wonder what's this reflection in terms of RTT equation means you're taking T dual. So or... in terms of RTT, so, okay, from the algebraic point of view, this is just, so this is from some point of view, very combinatorial structure is what I can see. So- Sorry, if, if there is no simple answer, just it's, it's okay. I'm uh, just wondering what this- It's not a simple answer, it's just, 
basically these dual vertices actually coincide with the original vertices, but in different bases. Okay. So that's what answer I wanted to give. And this, in order to this base and like this constant will appear when you will try to change these bases and compare the vertices you want with the original vertices. So basically this, so though I'm trying to like distinguish this reflected weights and the original weights, but essentially this is, these are the same weights, but written in a different way. So that's some sort of an answer. And that's why this young Baxter equation holds and it will just follow similarly after some rescaling from the initial Young-Baxter equation for this model. And well, after establishing this dual weights and- the... I'm, I'm sorry, what is the weight like in your Young-Baxter equation when pink like crosses um, gray line? Uh, well, okay, so this will coincide with the usual error matrix but one will need to take into account some symmetries. So this weight will actually coincide with the original weight uh, for air matrix, but here you will have K and I, and instead of J and L, you will have one minus J and one minus L. So this is essentially the same vertex weight as six vertex model weight, but written like slightly different notation. Thank you. Does this answer the question? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, but, but the point, okay. The, the main point I want to stress is that it's not like the exact value of the base, but the, rather the fact that such weights exist and because this is more surprising property, but yeah, actually this face just six vertex face, but written in different notation. So having established this nomenclature for the dual weights, now we can prove young equation by drawing such an identity. We take our original vertex model and on top of it, we add the dual one. And then we draw this additional vertices on the right side of this of this partition function, which somehow will send all the red paths to the bottom and all the gray ones to the top. And then we apply repeatedly all these Yambach's equations between dual vertices and the original ones to move all this grid of vertices to the left. And the resulting identity will actually coincide with Cauchy identity because here we'll have a sum over all configurations of the model. And if we will cut it in the middle and read the configuration of along the columns in the middle as some partition lambda, then the part on the bottom will give me one function of lambda. The dual part will give me another part of this Cauchy identity. And uh, on the right-hand side, since I have zeros here and zeros on top, uh, all this partition function will be essentially one, it will be actually one because it will have only one allowed configuration inside of it, which consists of all zeros. Now, these additional vertices I have added on the left and on the right can be explicitly computed and they will result in this Cauchy kernel of the Cauchy identity. And this, this computation is simple, but I just don't want to give it because it's slightly technical due to the free boundary conditions on the left. But basically 
after encoding our original functions and dual functions as vertex models and using compacity equation, we can prove the cachet density is not big technical work. And let me return to the original slide here. Uh, excuse me yes. one second. I just want to repeat my question maybe in slightly different form. Okay. So the most general form to write uh, and Baxter type relation is R T1 T2 equals T2 T1 R. Just yes. reflecting them. So the basic is when all RTs are the same. This is Jan Baxter equation for R. Now, it seems that in you, you use some relation when T1 and T2 are connected in one or other way. One is a conjugate to the other. Or can you give precisely what is needed for T1? What is the relation for T1 and T2? These are exactly the weights of your model and conjugated one. So is it indeed just conjugation or more, in, more involved? So. Because somehow you consider two models with two different ways. One is encoded in T1, the other in T2. And you use just to this kind well, of... So there should be some algebraic relation or some between T1 I mean, and T2. This... Okay, I cannot okay. answer this question algebraically. But basically, all of this is based on a certain symmetry because this dual weights can be written in a different way from the original model, where instead of some reflection, we just switch j's and l's to like one minus j and one minus l. So, mm -hmm. and these weights will require no conjugation. So, sorry, may I comment? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, I think this is a conjugation by a diagonal, diagonal matrix. That is true. So, so uh, this uh, overall factor, which multiplies the matrix elements, depends on on lambda only. And uh, for for the whole transfer matrix, it's just a conjugation by a di di diagonal matrix. Okay. Thank you. So. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I see. Okay, yes. Yeah, this is probably the right answer to the original question. Thank you. Okay, so return to this slide. Basically, what I just did is I introduced some new functions which have a lot of algebraic, well, some number of algebraic properties, and all of these properties can be proved using the Baxter equation one and another way. And it turns out that these functions in some way generalize whole little symmetric functions. In particular, this gives us a way to prove combinatorial properties of whole little functions, for example, Cauchy identities using Young Baxter equation. But actually, instead of adding just one parameter, we can make much more general generalization much more general model where we have an infinite number of spin parameters and also an infinite number of additional spectral parameters. Because in all my proofs, I have used only young Baxter equations to go through one column at a time. So if I will have different spin parameters in different columns that will correspond to having different representations along these vertical lines, then actually all the proofs I just mentioned will work without any change. And moreover, since my cross vertex depended on the ratio of spectral parameter, 
shifts between the vertex weights of the original model. Uh, I can multiply this phase by an additional parameter xi, and this will all this will not also this will also not affect my Young Baxter equation. So the idea is that everything I just done can be repeated without any change with a model with much more general family of additional parameters. And this model will still can like satisfy a shared identity. It will be symmetric and will satisfy all other properties I mentioned for the original spin hole little functions. So okay, this is somehow concluding remark about spin hole little functions. Now let me tell you about another model, namely about in certain states, a dual family of functions named Q Whitaker functions, which while whole little case coincided with the case when the parameter Q is equal, the McDonald parameter Q is equal to zero. Here we have the other parameter t equal to zero. Oh, also I forgot to mention, but um, in this way, it's, I have parameter q, which is actually parameter t of whole little functions. So this is some notational inconvenience that the quantum parameter of quantum group actually can be seen as both parameter t in symmetric functions and parameter q in symmetric functions. So previously, my parameter q actually corresponded to parameter t, while now my parameter q of Whitaker functions is genuine quantization parameter of the underlying quantum group. So, okay, let me just describe you the model I want to work with. So now, instead of having only vertical edges with the arbitrary integer parameters. Now I will have both vertical and horizontal edges with the arbitrary number, uh, integer number labeling them, which will correspond to the fact that now I don't have any restriction on the number of paths along vertical or horizontal direction. The vertex weights can be given explicitly by this expression. I don't want to go into the structure of this expression, but I would rather tell you where this expression comes from in terms of quantum groups. So basically, instead of considering R matrix acting on a two dimensional representation and a Verma module, we can instead consider an R matrix acting on a tensor product of two Verma models with different highest weights. And the matrix coefficients of such R matrix will coincide with the vertex weights with very general vertex weights depending on three parameters, one spectral parameter and two spin parameters corresponding to the highest weights of Verma models. Unfortunately, these general weights have, have an explicit expression, but this explicit expression is rather complicated. It is given in terms of Q hypergeometric functions like 4, P3 or something like that. And uh, it's not so easy to work with them. But if we will set the spectral parameter equal to one there, so we will consider a certain degeneration of these general weights, the result will be rather simple ways which are listed above. So this ways basically are just particular case of matrix coefficients of the general R matrix between Verma models of UQS ultra. And the parameter T and S here correspond to the spin parameters along the horizontal and vertical directions. As a consequence of this construction, the resulting case was also a bunch of young Baxter equations, which will just be a particular cases of general young Baxter equation for R matrix acting between three arbitrary Verma models. 
So with this weights, I consider the following model, which again has several lines and columns and on bottom and on the right, I have uh, uh, zero boundary conditions. On top, I again encode my arbitrary partition lambda with uh, the number of paths entering, uh, exiting through the first column being lambda one minus, minus lambda two, yeah. then the next column lambda two minus lambda three and so on. And on the left, I have essentially three boundary conditions, but I also need to multiply my partition function by some weight depending on an exact boundary value so on the left. So essentially, this part just tells me that on the left, I have three boundary conditions with some additional weight coming from it. So now, the parameters here look a bit complicated, but the idea is still similar. So here I have the same spin parameter corresponding to columns, while along rows I have different parameters, which in a certain way just a rescalement of my variables of functions kappa one and kappa, so on kappa n. So again, along the rows I will encode the variables of my resulting functions. So the resulting partition function have is is called spin qubit tracking function because when the spin parameter will be set to zero, one can verify. But well, this computation is a bit more involved, and I don't present it here. But when the spin parameter is equal to zero, one can verify that the resulting function will be just the usual symmetric qubit functions from McDonald theory. I'm sorry, what, what are the boundary conditions from the left? They are free, but uh, th they have an additional weights depending on the exact values on the left. So on the left, I can have a1 and 2 and a n and so these are not number of paths, A1 and 2. Yes, a. this is number of paths entering to the left and mm -hmm. AN and so on, AN are arbitrary, but ah, okay. they have an additional weight. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the resulting partition functions will actually satisfy all the properties I mentioned for spin little functions and the proofs will be almost the same. They will be based on the very similar young Baxter or architecture relation arguments. So in order to prove that they're symmetric, we'll just add uh, additional vertex on the right and move it through the whole partition function to the left using certain young Baxter equation. To prove the cachet identity, we will draw a dual vertex model on top of the original one and using uh, proper renormalized and properly conjugated version of the general young Baxter equation for the between three Verma models, we will get the right young Baxter equation, which will allow us to exchange the dual model and the original one. And the resulting Cachet identity will look like this. And well, the, the difference is that now the Cachet kernel will depend on the spin parameter, which was not the case for spin for little functions. But it still will be a product of some group of Hamer symbols. And actually, one can connect uh, these spin q functions and uh, spin whole little functions proving something similar to so-called dual cache identity, which in the original theory of symmetric functions is a very similar identity which connects whole little functions and uh, q functions. So here we have t and q equal to one times the same function, but t is equal to one and q arbitrary. 
when the partition key is conjugated and this will be some product of x, y, y, j. This is the usual dual cache identity from McDonald theory. And actually we have a very similar cache identity for this higher spin setting, where instead of drawing the dual Kubitaker model on top of the original Kubitaker model, we can now take the original model for Kubitaker functions I described on the previous slide. Uh, but on top of it, we can draw the model for, for little functions. And then it turns out that the, one can degenerate the general cache identity in a way that it will be sufficient to prove uh, this dual cache identity by exchanging the model for Kubitaker and for little functions between each other. And, literally repeating the same argument again. So in certain way, while these models look different, essentially they somehow can be connected in, a, in the same framework, which for, from which we have this spin generalization of all little functions, spin generalization of Kubitaker functions, and they have various cache identities for each other and dual cache identity between them. And all of this can be proved using suitable young Baxter equations as a building block for all these identities. So let me tell you some extension of this story, which is the part to which I am personally related to and where I have done something. So as I mentioned before, instead of considering one spin parameter for, for little functions, I could have added various spin parameters for columns and also additional parameters xi also along the columns. And since I mentioned all these spin functions and vertex models for these functions come in this single framework where we have certain duality between spin for little functions and spin theoretical functions. So a natural question to ask is if we can do something similar by adding two sequences of parameters, in the case of, in the second case I described in the case of theoretical functions. And the story here becomes slightly more complicated because it turns out that the Traditional Baxter equations, which come from like usual this three term commutation relation between operators acting on triple tensor product of Fermat models, it turns out that this Young Baxter equation is not enough, and we don't know how to degenerate this Young Baxter equation in order to get the most more general homogeneous model. But Instead, it turns out that we need some sort of deformation of the Baxter equation, which we can prove combinatorially, but finding some algebraic motivation for their existence, we still have no idea how to do this. And let me show what I'm talking about. So here is a cache identity, which or this is the Baxter equation, which is used to prove that the spin Kubitaker functions are symmetric. And here the parameters T1, T2, and S correspond to the spins of uh, my representations. But it turns out that for these degenerated weights where I have set my spectral parameter to one, I can actually add an additional parameter to this equation in a way which will break the usual interpretation in terms of uh, uh, Riemann models because now this spin parameters will be inconsistent along columns and draws. And from the point of view of quantum groups, this is something weird. But it turns out that this identity holds like formal combinatorial identity of partition functions. And also there is another cache identity which is used to into like exchange the theoretical model and the dual spin hole little one. 
And also, this is without parameters at this is the usual cache, uh, the usual master equation, which can be obtained by setting one of the spin parameters to Q to suitable power of Q and rearranging spectral parameters in a needed way. But then it turns out that for this degenerated case of my special weights, where I set spectral parameter to one, I can add an additional parameter here, which will again somehow break the usual integrability, like understanding of Young Buster equation. And actually there exists a third version which can be used for Cauchy identity, but it is still not quite ready. But the uh, idea is that for this- Excuse me, but if you look on your picture from uh, on 45 degrees angle, it's still the yeah. equation, but R is would be rather the matrix acting in the tensor products of two thick lines. No, but the point is that, so in the Yavax equation, I have three operators, mm -hmm. which are somehow exchanged in a certain way. But here we can see that on the left hand side, I have a vertex with like parameters T1 and T2. But on the right hand side, I don't have such vertex. Instead, I have some additional vertex which is not present on the left hand side. So this is certain addition of a parameter here, which instead of being like commutation relation between three operators acting on pairs of representation, now I have on the left hand side and right hand side different operators and which depend on this additional parameter and they somehow non trivially cancel out so the resulting identity still holds mm -hmm. okay. i'm and sorry uh, yes. okay can you uh, specialize uh, um, like take uh, the value of spin so that uh, it will be reducible here uh, I think there are there, there is a possibility to take spin uh, to some relation of spin and uh, and t. Uh, I mean, uh, some value of spin so that uh, some coefficients will will be zero then. That is... and then how you sum these two? Uh, uh, well, uh, how 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 you sum this convolution of t s and eta t eta s. Um, this is the question. Okay, so yeah, there definitely exist certain values of spin where this model becomes somehow restricted. If you, if I properly get your question, yeah, uh, that will be, for example, restricted on the upper uh, vertex, but on the lower vertex, because you have a, an extra parameter, it will be. Uh, not restricted or restricted in yes. different way. And then how yes. you uh, understand this sum over this line? Well, I mean, what does it mean to be restricted? It, so there are two ways to restrict the model. First one, the, when the sum weights will be zero and essentially while all the weights still exist, uh, I just will ah, get okay. some regime of my vertex model from which it cannot leave mm -hmm. and because there will be some value of weights zero which will for example will not allow me to increase like from g from the label g to the label g plus one and this is one situation and in this situation this identity still hold but uh, some weights will be zero okay. also there is another possibility when vertex weights become ill-defined so this possibility does not happen here because all these poles of my various of spin parameters will actually cancel out. Right, okay, thank you. So yes, basically we can deform this Yambach state equations and add an additional parameter in this case. And well, the resulting model will have a lot of parameters, but the idea is that now we will have some parameters which will be encoded along the rows, some parameters which will be encoded along the columns and which will can be interpreted as something which is property of the corresponding column. But now we additionally have some parameters which 
go along diagonals and this is something new and I still don't know how to, this can be interpreted in terms of integrability and solubility of vertex models. So the basic idea I wanted to tell is that when we try to generalize this inhomogeneous setting for spin hole literal functions, which was quite natural, here we get something new, which requires some additional Young-Buster equations and uh, will create some new parameters which go along diagonals, which I don't quite understand from algebraic point of view, but combinatorially just some collection of identities. So that's basically wraps up the whole story about spin whole literal functions and spin cubitical functions. So and that's basically the main part of my talk. Now let me talk a little bit about other models, which are more general vertex models. So basically everything I've talked about up to now was a certain models coming from containerization of affine SL2 algebra. But instead we can consider more general algebra, higher rank algebras. And it turns out that the corresponding vertex models uh, should be interpreted as, well, can be interpreted as colorizations of the UQ SL2 models. Namely, instead of having labels, for example, from one to, from zero to one, in more general case, we'll have labels from zero to N, which we can interpret as colors. And well, here we had just paths, which had color one and also empty, pair, empty line segments, which can be interpreted as pairs of color zero. Here for the more general higher rank models, we have paths of different colors with colors being ordered and numbered from one to M. And also we have some empty places which we treat as paths of color zero. And we can generalize a lot of constructions I mentioned before. Uh, namely, there is a colored analog of six vertex model, which I drew here, which have exactly the same weights, but now the model is colored and instead of situation where we like distinguish existence of paths and the fact that there is no path, now we distinguish which color is bigger and treat the smaller color as the same as like empty color, empty paths before. So basically we can construct this colored analog of six vertex model and uh, this model will still will still satisfy your master equations and using them we can construct more general functions namely repeating the whole the story i made for the spin hole little functions but in the card case we obtained so-called non-symmetric spin hole little functions so let me first tell you what are non-symmetric functions in from the point of view of the theory of Semantic functions of this one don't hierarchy. So, semantic functions generally are enumerated by partitions, which can be interpreted as, in a certain way, as dominant weights for the corresponding root system AN. But it turns out that semantic functions, well, in the most general case, namely in the case of McDonald functions, can be constructed from the more elementary blocks, which are called non-symmetric functions. And basically they interpret symmetric functions as a sum over the orbit of wild group of the corresponding dominant weight. And now the non-symmetric functions will be indexed by an arbitrary compositions where we don't have any ordering on them, the one and then the end. And the original symmetric functions will because can be constructed from this non-symmetric analogs by 
taking the sum over all permutations of these compositions. And the result will be the corresponding semantic function for the dominant ordering of this composition. So and it turns out that this non-symmetric analog can be extended in this spin setting. And in terms of vertex models, this expansion in terms of the orbit of the Y group, like, like decomposing into these blocks, smaller blocks, can be seen as coloring our vertex model in different ways. So the model for the spin non-symmetric colloidal functions uh, looks literally the same as the model for symmetric spin colloidal functions. On the bottom, we have zeros. So nothing can just model from the bottom and nothing can exit from the right. Well, on the left, we have paths of different colors entering from entering the model. And these colors are assumed to be monotonically ordered. So we start with the smallest color and then go up until the highest one. And on the top, we somehow record our color, comp our composition, which enumerates this non symmetric function by telling that the pass of the first color should exit the model in the lambda first column. Now, the pass of the second color should exit to the lambda seconds column, and so on. And it turns out that after constructing this vertex model, we can repeat a lot of arguments from before with suitable modifications. Namely, we can prove something, some analog of Cauchy identity called Mimachi-Naomi identity, which is essentially generalization of Cauchy identity for non-symmetric functions. When spin parameters will be set to zero, the resulting functions will coincide with the non-symmetric or little functions. And instead of the argument which proved that our functions are symmetric, here we will don't we will not have this symmetry, but instead the symmetry will turn out in certain relation in terms of uh, divided difference operators which will somehow connect these functions with each other. But basically, you can study these functions using a Baxter equation, and you can still prove a lot of properties of them. And that's basically it for all the spin analogs I have. Now, let me briefly describe more interesting, but uh, much more mysterious model, namely let me finally get to McDonald functions. So, so there exists a vertex model for McDonald functions, but unfortunately compared to the all previous instances, in this case, our knowledge of, our understanding of this model is much worse. So let me first describe the model. Uh, the model looks, almost the same as the previous one, namely we have the grid consisting of several lines where we have only one path along them and columns where every number of paths can go through them. And we have the vertex weights, which can start with the vertex weights I used before, but with spin parameter set to zero. And uh, then I consider the same model where my paths are entering from the left and nothing exits from the bottom or from the right, but with one modification. Now I have a periodic binary condition on top and on the bottom. So basically my paths can go up and then return to the model from the bottom in the same column and do several cycles around, around this cylinder before they reach the column where they should exit, at which point they just stop and do nothing. And with each of this cycle, they will pick up a certain coefficient, Q8TB, depending on the color composition, which is used to encode my McDonald's polynomial. And it turns out that this combinatorial model will recover the non-symmetric polynomials. But 
using a box equation, the only thing we can prove using a box equation is the fact that the resulting non-symmetric functions will be eigenfunctions of so-called chernik dunkel operators. But after this, our understanding of what to do with this function is becoming much poor, much more poor, because well, we can't repeat the same doubling argument with like dual vertex model because of this cyclic boundary conditions. And basically we don't know how to, for example, prove Mimachi Naomi identities for these general McDonald functions using for shared identity. And in, in particular, that's why I did not describe any spin analogs of McDonald functions because one can try to construct them, but there is no proof of the fact that the resulting spin conjectural deformation of McDonald functions satisfies some good identities like Mimachi Naomi type formulas or Cauchy identities or some other nice properties we should expect from symmetric or non symmetric functions. That's why this model is interesting and at the same time somehow mysterious and it's yet unknown what to do with it and how this can be extended to produce something new. So that's basically everything I wanted to talk about today. So let me just sum up what I described during this talk. So basically, some symmetric functions, namely whole little functions and theoretical functions, can be described in terms of vertex models, which can basically come as some generalizations of six vertex model, or alternative can be seen as vertex models with weights coming from quantization of affine SL2 algebra. And this vertex model constructions allows us to prove various combinatorial properties of these two families of symmetric functions. And in addition, it allows us to construct more general analogs of these functions, which I call spin analogs of this whole Littlewood and Hugh Whitaker functions. And we can extend everything to non-symmetric functions by adding colors to our models or increasing the rank of the group we are considering. Actually, there are more things to tell about such formalism. So first of all, through this talk, I mostly stick to like combinatorial point of view on these functions, but actually this spin analogs somehow naturally appeared in so-called integral probability. And this is one initial way how they were discovered before vertex models. And I, haven't, I did not talk about today, but essentially this pinhole little functions can be seen as eigenfunctions for certain operators related to particle systems. Also, another thing which is very recent and uh, like works about it appeared like this January, for example, or the preceding fall. And this is the idea that apart from considering uh, the quantum groups for SLN, we can instead consider super algebras and somehow super vertex models, which are related to super algebra JL and M. And such models turn out to give some good functions also, namely they give in another vertex model representation of donor functions and also for using them, you can construct so-called LT polynomials. Also, there are other functions which are not from this hierarchy of semantic functions, which can be described using these vertex models, but this is definitely out of my reach and the scope of this talk. So I guess that's about it. And this is the end. Okay, thanks. Seriously, in your last slide, you answered the question I wanted to ask, uh, namely, Good. what's the goal? Because the whole talk was about the construction of certain symmetric or non-symmetric functions, some hierarchy of functions using uh, vertex model. So uh, I was thinking about for non 
or a person who is far from the theory of symmetric function? What is the use of them? So you answer that they they were discovered and moreover they have application to the integrable probability. Uh, I, I see among participants, Alyosha Baradin. Alyosha, are you willing to give at some moment a talk at this seminar introducing the notion of integral probability just to have an overview of what was told? Of course. How can I say no? Um, uh, that was my goal to, to force you to to say yes, because you see, without general view on the what's going on, uh, it would be just uh, we will miss a lot of very important points. But uh, let, let me also mention, since since you asked, tomorrow I uh, um, I start topics class at MIT, and even though in Moscow time it's it's pretty late, but there will be recordings in 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 the first few lectures I'll probably give some sort of a survey of what integral probability the objects that it looks at and to those who can dedicate more time than um, than a sing single talk um, they could take a look but uh, sure you know at some point giving a survey of um, yeah, yeah, why, yeah. why these things are probabilistic probabilistically relevant yeah absolutely okay thank you so uh... Will be touch. Uh, I'll force you to talk at this seminar. Thank you. And more questions. May I ask a question? Uh, Sergey, uh, any symmetric function can be expressed in terms of uh, some symmetric functions like elementary or power sums and so on. Whether there are vertex models for these expressions, not for the original. Uh, I don't know about such vertex models. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat the question? The question is whether there are vertex model representations for what, for expansion coefficients of one basis in terms of the other? Uh, not for expansion coefficients, but uh, for the for the very same symmetric functions, say for sure functions, but expressed not in terms of the original variables x, but uh, in power sums p or elementary symmetric functions or whatever. Oh, but these are expansion coefficients. You want the the transition matrix from one basis of symmetric mm -hmm. functions to the other basis. You want the transition matrix between the sure functions and, and, and P functions or E functions or something like that, right? In a sense, yeah. Yes, so, so, so then, yes, the, there are vertex models that provide um, different types of um, expansion, of expansion coefficients, so like Q cost numbers, for example, um, in the simplest case. Um, um, little Richardson coefficients. Um, there are classes, and, and vertex models can be used to produce formulas for them as partition functions. Um, but this is in the what what Sarah talked about is sort of the beginning of that story. One needs to build something on top of it in order to get to these um, transition coefficients. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And what happened in, in other series, like not uh, A, N, or B, or C, or D? Is it uh, some kind of the, the, the such signs, uh, uh, such polynomes uh, there? And what are the res results from, uh, like, from the other series? So as far as I know, there are some works about BC types of models, and there, the thing you should do is to instead of such vertex models I just instead of vertex models I described today, you should add reflections in them and uh, some u turns and stuff like that. And adding such stuff allows you to reach some results about BC types models. But as far as I know, probably some people here will correct me, but 
for D type models, it's not so clear what to do. At this point, okay. the people who were doing you. this, I heard that this fork and the Dinkin diagrams causes some complications and it's not so clear how to represent such forks in terms of protest models. Okay, thank you. May I ask a question? Sure. Uh, okay, Pasha first. Uh, thank you. Uh, so so uh, I wanted to ask uh, what happens uh, with uh, this uh, colored uh, uh, non symmetric polynomials if we uh, uh, permute uh, only variables of uh, the same color? Uh, is it uh, some non trivial uh, operation? They're symmetric in the same color. Ah, ah, so they they kind of they are kind of uh, symmetric in uh, in the group in groups of variables, right? Yes. Ah. Uh, and uh, uh, are they labeled uh, by the uh, um, by interpos uh, of uh, young diagrams? Mm? Uh, are they are they labeled by collections of uh, the young diagrams? Um. Well, they are labeled by sort of compositions which are somehow colored. I mean, it's more like you should think about it as a young diagram where each rose has an additional color. It's not like a collection of young diagrams. Collection of young diagrams is a different object, more complicated object. Yeah, here you have an addition. So on top of the young diagram, you just Describe some coloring of it in terms of an ordered colors. And that's the object which enumerates these functions. Thank you. Side. Okay, and my question is, uh, what's the problem of uh, including uh, this S parameter into McDonald's picture? So the problem is that we don't know how to justify properties of the conjectural spin generalization of this McDonald parameters. So from combinatorial point of view, this new spin parameter is somehow justified for how little than Q-Vitica functions because there exists all sorts of cache densities for these new functions. But how to prove something similar for McDonald generalization, we don't know. And also we don't know any other source from where to take such spin generalization of McDonald functions. So do I understand right that uh, you cannot prove the, for example, Cauchy identity, even in McDonald's case by this technique, right? Yes. But, uh, and so of course you cannot prove it with, uh, for spin generalization, but for spin exactly. you don't, you, you, you cannot even say that this is something familiar. Doesn't mean yes. that, it's, that, that it's bad, it's just. Uh, okay. Yes. So yeah, there are some conjectural constructions of the spin McDonald functions, which on one way de degenerate to McDonald functions and then the other way generate to degenerate to spin whole little functions, but we cannot prove anything about, well, we can prove something, but we cannot prove Cauchy type formulas for them. That's why I decided not to talk about them. Okay, thank you. And you on this slide you have this QA TB like additional weight, but like yes. for the in in the definition of non-symmetric McDonald polynomials we have only Q and T parameters. So how can it possible? So yeah, wait, we have Q and T parameters. So yeah, this okay. is oh wait, parameter A and B is some integers which depend on the partition on this color ah. composition lambda and mm -hmm. on the position of the column where this winding appears. It seems that the oh, yeah, this is numbers how you go along one cycle and along the other number, like yes. a winding numbers. Yes, yes, yes. In such a way, this is just some integers which are defined by the model mm -hmm. and where are this, this appears. Yes. Are this A and B the same for all colors? No, they will be different for all colors. They will be, they will depend on like the distance for this color till the column where it should exit. 
it will depend on the other color on the position of exit on the exit position of other colors between these two spaces so it will somehow complicated depend on the various positions of lambdas between this column and the exit one and yes when parameter q will be set to zero actually all these integers a are greater than one that's why all these windings will become forbidden and he will recover for little model Does it give a new nice formula for non-symmetric McDonald polynomials? Well, I mean, it gives a new formula. Well, whether it's nice, it is the property of, it's not objective property. It's more like a property of your taste. Uh, you can get some result from such vertex model representations about McDonald functions, but probably, Alexei is more qualified to talk about it than I am. Oh, uh, but for so example, the, as far as I recall, uh, yeah, yeah, you can continue. The, 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 this gives a combinatorial formula for non-symmetric McDonald polynomials, which can be shown to imply um, the, um, the formula that was known for a while by Hyman, Haglund, and Lohr. Um, this this um, vertex model formula is actually a refinement of that one. Okay, even taking into account the late start of our seminar, we are longer than usual. So, any other questions? Um, may I ask one more question? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to ask uh, what happens uh, with uh, this uh, non-symmetric McDonald uh, polynomials with cars, uh, when we put uh, Q equals to T? This, I don't know. This is an interesting question. What happens with this model when Q is equal to T? I cannot answer the question how one can see true functions here. Uh, but is, is it uh, correct uh, or sh should it be correct that uh, they should uh, uh, factorize into the product of uh, short functions uh, depending on different lambdas uh, or not? No, 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 no. The, the Q equal T non-symmetric McDonald polynomials are not much simpler than the general McDonald polynomials. It's, it's only, well, first of all, they will depend on the, on the Q equal to T, unlike the symmetric case when they become independent and become sure polynomials. Mm -hmm. And, and the, some, some simplification will occur when Q is equal to T and is equal to either zero or infinity. Then these objects become so-called them as your atoms. Um, they, occur reasonably naturally in, in representation theory, but they're still pretty complicated objects. They, they don't have explicit formulas. Um, they are a bit easier than non-symmetric McDonald polynomials, but certainly not in the complexity range of, of sure polynomials. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Sirius, again, and it's time to thank you. end our seminar. Yes. Yeah, thank you for the seminar and for the invitation and for the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.